Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a ranked perfumers portfolio video on what many consider to be one of the greatest perfumers to have ever lived, if not the greatest perfumer. Uh, that is a very fair topic to debate, and uh, especially if you look at the uh, 20th century, and that is the great Edmund Rudnitska. And so we're going to talk about his fragrances, but not just a regular perfumers portfolio video because we are going to rank this video and a couple points of topic on the ranking system. So um, these are my personal rankings. I have them ranked from my least favorite to my to my favorite to wear. That being said, the fragrance that is listed as my least favorite is what many consider to be technically maybe one of the greatest perfumes to have ever been created. So this is just sort of a fun video. These videos are just fun videos as sort of my preference to wear, what I prefer to reach for. Um, not, you know, if I remove my, um, if I remove my preference from uh, this ranking and I just went off of, let's say, technical uh, creation of the fragrance and how sound it is, technically sound. Uh, number nine in this case, this is only a top nine. I don't even have 10 fragrances from... Uh, from Edmund Rudnitska, and to be fair, uh, according to Parfumo, he only did 14 or so fragrances, 14 to 16, I think, um, and so he doesn't have a whole lot. He may have more attributed to him when you factor in things like, you know, the um, Esprit de Parfum of Miss Dior, the X-Ray of Miss Dior, because he did the reformulation. Uh, Jean Carls did the original Miss Dior, but since Edmund Rudnitska did the reformulation, uh, he is attributed to having some of these flankers. And there is one of those in this particular video. But um, most of these are, you know, well known that they're his work. And one of the reasons that he's so iconic is the mark that he left on perfumery decades and decades after he, after he passed away, after he stopped making fragrances. And... Um, you know, it, when you look at some of these, it's interesting because as a perfume nerd, his fragrances are so interesting to study because time after time after time, when you smell an Edmund Rudnitska fragrance, you will be reminded of something that came later on down the road. So when you smell something like Eau de Hermes, you're going to get a little bit of um, of Frederick Mall's Bigarade Concentré, apparently. Or the one that I think that Eau de Hermes smells like is this. This is um, Cartier by Declaration. This came out in the 90s, and this was a Jean-Claude Elena. And this is like a giant love letter to Eau de Hermes. And Eau de Hermes came out, you know, 50 years before this. Uh, and so it's just very interesting to see his style and, you know, his particular preferences for creating fragrances uh, show up by not only his pupils, because one of the reasons that um, Edmund Runitska is such a titan of a figure is it wasn't just his fragrances that he made, which obviously he did. He made some of my all-time favorite fragrances here. You're going to see some unbelievable fragrances. Um, all-time greats required sniffing. Not required buying, but required sniffing for a fragrance lover, I would say. Um, even if this isn't your style, I would still recommend trying to get your nose on this fragrance if you're trying to understand how fragrances evolved throughout the decades, especially in the 20th century, if you're trying to understand sort of the connections and how, you know, one fragrance sort of influenced another, how one genre led into another, Edmund Rudnitska is the master to study. And not only was he the master to study, but he was the master of two pupils, three really if you count his son, Michel Runitska, um, who made some amazing fragrances in his own right. But uh, the two big ones that most people think about are Pierre Bourdon and Jean-Claude Elena. And so we could talk for an hour probably just about how the connections and the relationship between Edmund Runitska and his pupils spawned further creation in the fragrance industry. You could make a direct link from Edmund Runitska to Aventus, and that sounds insane. But it's true when you think about the fact that Edmund Rudnitska taught Pierre Bourdon, and Pierre Bourdon was the student that got most of Edmund Rudnitska's attention and, um, you know, the detail-oriented side of his creation. And you can smell 
sort of uh, Edmund Runitzka's DNA in Pierre Bourdon fragrances, even up until the mid-90s. Once he sort of passed away, Pierre Bourdon started to, to generate more and more of his own style, I think. But what's interesting is then Pierre Bourdon, of course, went to take on the same, you know, master, pupil, whatever you want to call it, teacher, student archetype. And he ended up teaching Jean-Christophe Hero, who created Aventus. Um, and so it's just very interesting when you kind of think about some of these connections because, you know, Aventus is technically a Shepra. It is. Um, and some of the frag, some of the uh, frag bros may not like to hear that, but it's true. Aventus is a fruity Shepra. That's what it is. Uh, and it has sort of this strange interplay between fruits and the Shepra construction. And if you think about that, Edmund Runitzka was doing stuff like that with Diorella, he was doing it with things like uh, Le Parfum de Therese, which we wouldn't really uncover until, um, you know, decades and decades later when it finally came out in the year 2000 for uh, Frederick Mall. But he created this decades before other perfumers were doing this type of style. You know, he was playing with notes here that didn't catch on until, you know, 20 or 25 years after his creation of, of uh, Le Parfum de Therese, and we'll talk about some of that once we get into the individual fragrances, but I just want to set the groundwork and why many people think that Edmund Runitzka is the greatest uh, perfumer of all time. And I'm going to read you a couple things on him, but first, I do want to do scent of the day. Actually, I want to do water of the day because I ended up getting a, um, what is this called? Thermo flask. It was on sale from Costco. You got two of these for 20 bucks. They're usually 40 not too shabby. I got to save money where I can. Um, perfumes are getting expensive. So this thing's kind of cool because everyone was telling me, ah, you know, the, and I just spilled it all over myself. I'm not used to having a, a 40 ounce, pour a 40 out, right? Um, excuse me whilst I hydrate. I'm not used to having um, 40 ounces, but everyone kept telling me that, uh, hey man, you're a uh, those water bottles you're drinking, they're going to like, the plastics are going to melt. You're going to drink it. You're going to catch all this crazy stuff. You should switch to something that is, uh, what is it, BPH free or something? I don't know, but it was on sale, so I sprung for it. Um, but that's going to be my new water bottle. No more no more Fiji bottles, I don't think. Plus, they're expensive. Okay, so um, let's do scent of the day because scent of the day is a first time wear for me. And I must admit, I liked it. But I didn't love it, and I'll tell you why. It's a fantastic fragrance. Uh, I think one of the best out-and-out -out musk fragrances that you can find. But for my taste, I would much prefer Inverno Russo because Inverno Russo uses more of that musk pod, um, the skin of the musk pod, which gives off that sort of leathery animalic bit. This, I feel like, uses more of the traditional powdery sweet. There's a little bit of sweetness to it. Um, you know, a little bit of this like attractive, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an attractive sweetness with a little bit of this pissy musky quality to it. And this is called Russian musk and shout out, special shout out to my friend Hari, who very kindly found this bottle for me. I've been looking for this for, uh, it feels like a year. I mean, it's been impossible to find, absolutely impossible to find. And everyone kept saying this is one of the best musk fragrances of all time. And they're right, but it's not my favorite musk fragrance. My favorite musk would be something like Siberian musk or Inverno Russo. Those are the two that I really rate for my personal taste. If you like animalic musks, those are the ones to go for. This is, yes, it is an animalic. Yes, it is. Um, but it opens up much more focused on that lemony sort of green pine type thing in, in the top. And you get a lot of lemon and fir balsams and pine resins and pine and stuff like that. And um, you also get cinnamon and clove and tonka and sandalwood and nutmeg. And it's a beautiful fragrance. There's three types of oud in the base. There's Cambodian oud, Sri Lankan oud, and Burmese oud. There's amber and cypress, which I love cypress. Cypress blends beautifully with that pine and fir in the top. So you kind of get this green tone all throughout. Even the juice kind of looks greenish, doesn't it? Uh, the label is green, so there is definitely a green tint to this. But I wore this today as my scent of the day, and I wore it to work. And it's actually a beautiful musk fragrance for work. I had no clue what I was getting into, because this is the first time I've smelled it today uh, when, I, when I wore it to work. And um, 
you get oak moss. There's actually Thai oud in here too, so there's four types of oud, but it doesn't come off as very animalic to me. And the other thing it doesn't do is it doesn't last as long where it really pushes. You know, once you get to that five or six hour mark, it really stays close to the skin. It's a it's a very professional gentleman scent is the way that I view it. This is for somebody who doesn't want to shout or scream, but if someone gets in your bubble, I mean, you're going to smell like you're going to smell like a prophet or an angel wearing something like this. I mean, it is harmonic. It is um, uh, the smell is gorgeous. It's beautiful. Uh, there's rose and vetiver and other things in here as well, but I prefer the more animalic, leathery, challenging musks that use the musk pod skin, I think. And this really feels like you get a lot more of that powdery inner, you know, a little bit of that sweetness. Sort of this, um, uh, musk is a very hard scent. Real musk is one of the hardest scents I've ever had to describe on the channel because it has this slightly pissy element. Um, you know, and you imagine the musk pod being very connected somehow to the male deer pissing in the forest. There's a little bit of that pissy aspect to it, if you will, but it's also supposed to attract females, right? So the, the, um, uh, uh, musk deer uses it to mark his territory, but also to lure in potential mates. And so you get a little bit of this pissy. It's almost like a mixture of slight, you know, warning and this uh, extreme um, sort of narcotic, like, um, uh, you know, sweet muskiness. It's very hard to describe. Um, extremely hard. It's a little bit powdery. Uh, sometimes musk, to me, has little touches of iris in it, even though I know there's no iris in this fragrance. The powderiness, sometimes there's a slight connection to it. Um, and I think for somebody who likes that traditional musk smell, okay, this could be like a grail fragrance for them. And I love having it, but I would rank it below the more animalic challenging musks to my nose, but really enjoyed every second of wearing it today. That is Russian musk. Okay. So let's get on to Edmund Rudnitska's top nine fragrances. But first I want to read you a little blurb about him about the man himself, according to uh, Parfumo. So it says that Edmund Rudnitska is sell can, sorry, let's start again, shall we? Today, Edmund Rudnitska can undoubtedly be named the greatest perfumer of the 20th century and the innovator of modern perfumery. Born in Nice in 1905, the master perfumer began training in 1926 at Roar Boutrand in Grasse. There, he earned his first professional spurs before he moved to Issa Le Molyneux in the 1930s to work for the well-known fragrance manufacturer De Lair. Not only did Edmund Rudnitska find his professional destiny, but also love and his future wife, Teresa Delvaux. From then on, the gifted chemist was the wind beneath his wings, both professionally and privately. And interestingly enough, if you look up um, Le Parfum de... I'm sorry, that is not correct. If you look up um, Moustache, if you look up Moustache by uh, Rochas, which will be ranked in this video, obviously, um, she is listed as a co-perfumer, and she claims that she actually helped him create this fragrance. And, um, you know, rumor is that he kind of ruthlessly mocked her for that during his life. He was a very tough man to work for. Pierre Bourdon will attest to that. Jean-Claude Elena will attest to that. He was extremely demanding. Almost like a, um, you know, like like an old uh, Nick Saban college coach, you know, that sort of, um, uh, what college coach am I thinking of from, from, from the old times? Uh, I'm thinking of the Alabama coach that won't come to my mind. Some, someone will, will tell me. But this very militaristic-like uh, style, you know, that's what I think about when I think about uh, Edmund Runitska. Uh, extremely uh, organized and extremely tough, but tough because he wants you to kind of get better and, and be the best that you can be and bring out greatness. And he did that in both of his pupils, Jean-Claude Elena and Pierre Bourdon. And of course, he also did it with his son, Michel Rudnitska. Um, so in 1943, his career began. Marcel Rochas commissioned a fragrance under the name Femme that would equally represent the fashion house and its discerning clientele. This fragrance made Edmund Runitska famous and sought after overnight in the sophisticated world of haute courtier. 
Encouraged by the first overwhelming success, the Rudnitska couple founded their first own laboratory in 1946 in Bacon-les-Brues near Paris, which was entirely dedicated to perfume production. From then on, the company's name, Art and Perfume, was the ultimate destination for international designers who longed to create great things in the field of beautiful and noble fragrances. In 1949, the notable laboratory moved to Sybris, near Grasse, to be closer to the heart of the perfume capital of the world. Edmund Rudnitska lived and worked there until he died in 1996. Among his greatest successes, which still enjoy great popularity today, are Diorissimo, Au Sauvage, he created its you for Elizabeth Arden, never smelled it, and legendary Eau de Hermes for Hermes on the list. Uh, a successful collaboration resulted with the traditional house Frédéric Mal. The label holds the trademark rights to Le Parfum de Thérèse that Edmund Runitzka composed for his wife in the early 1950s. In 1990, his last creation, Ocean Rain for Men, for Mario Valentino, marked the end of his remarkable life's work before his son, Michel Rudnitska, took over. Beautiful little blurb there. Um, one thing that I will mention is that I um, am short a couple of um, Dior, Dior's that he made, some of the most classic Dior's. I don't have Dior Dior. I don't have Dior Ling. I don't have, uh, there's one or two others. Um, uh, which one is the other ones that I'm thinking of? Sorry, let me see if I can just pull them up real quick. So the other Dior's that he made that I'm thinking of that I am, I don't have is Diorama. So I don't have Diorama. I don't have uh, Dior Dior, and I don't have Dior Ling. So there's a couple, you know, big ones that uh, I, I've never smelled. It's You by Elizabeth Arden. Never even heard anyone really talk about that one. Um, and so there's still some of his work I obviously don't know. This is not a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination, um, but this is the list that I have in my, in, in my um, you know, uh, collection. So keep that in mind. This is not, uh, you know, some people, all, I always get the comment, what about Diorama? Well, I don't have it. I'm sorry. So it's not in the list. This is a list highlighting fragrances from my collection that Edmund Runitzka created. And this video idea was really founded, started uh, on the premise that I wanted to give more credit to the perfumer. It's kind of the same idea that um, Frederick Mall used by wanting to put, you know, the name on the bottle. Uh, I really feel like the perfumer um, does not get enough credit. And I feel like uh, as a consumer, when I'm looking for things to try, I have actually had better luck in following perfumers, you know, going to Parfumo and looking up what different perfumers have done and looking and, and searching for things that way rather than sticking to a single house. I've actually had better success staying with the perfumer and going, okay, I like Julian Raskinet, so let's see if I can try to find, you know, um, a Julian Raskinet fragrance. Russian Tea, for example, by Mask Milano. Or, you know, you take that strategy and just extrapolate it out. And it's worked brilliantly, brilliantly for me. But you have to know the perfumer, you have to know what they've done, and you have to have some level of uh, more than just a surface interest in fragrance. This is for people who you know, have a deep love and appreciation of perfume. Usually once you start getting into the perfumers, you're down the rabbit hole. I mean, once you start getting into notes and perfumers and, you know, the creation process and what came first, what came in 51, what came in 69, what came in, you know, 81 and in these different years and the houses, I mean, you're down the rabbit hole. That's it. At that point, at that point, you're in deep, you're deep in the game. Um, but it's an interesting way to search and it's important, I think, to give these people credit because you have to remember back in the day, there was no focus groups. Uh, these fragrances were created by an artist. Uh, perfumers now don't feel like perfumers from back in the day. The perfumer now feels like almost like a dog that's told what to do. You know, the houses tell them what to do if, if they're working for the big material, you know, the big houses and it has to get focus group, their work taps has to be changed, anything artistic gets taken out because one person doesn't like it, or you know how it goes. We've had these conversations before. Um, and so that makes it very tough for someone who wants to be a creative artist, right? Uh, you wanna be a creative artist and you wanna 
color outside the lines and you want to try to do things differently, they won't let you do that nowadays at the big houses. There's too much money at stake. Everything has to be focus tested to death, focus group tested to death. And so what many of those people are doing is they're founding their own house, they're creating their own house, and then they can do whatever they want, you know, being on the indie side of things. And that's where the fragrances, for the most part, for people like us are. Many of these big houses are not making fragrances for fragrance lovers. They're making fragrances for the masses, right? And so, but back in the day, the perfumer was the artist. And so that's what this whole series is about, you know, giving a nod, an homage, if you will, a thank you to the perfumers and, and what they've done and highlighting and highlighting them. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Okay, so let's get started. Number nine on the list. And again, I will say this, this is number nine on my list to reach for to wear personally. And if you know my taste, you probably know which one this will be. Uh, however, uh, this fragrance is considered by many to be his masterpiece. Believe it or not, this is considered, many consider this to be his masterpiece and a reference fragrance for Lily of the Valley. And just to give you a little blurb, Lily of the Valley cannot be extracted. Uh, there is no natural essence. It must be reconstructed to become usable in perfumery. And so there had, there had been Lily of the Valley perfumes before. But in 1956, Edmund Rudnitska succeeded with his reconstruction of this flower by using hydroxy citronellol, the main aroma component of Lily of the Valley, and other notes. This reconstruction was so good that it can count as the perfumer's masterpiece and reference fragrance for similar perfumes. Christian Dior allegedly had asked for his favorite flower as a perfume. He is said to have always had a lily of the valley blossom sewn into the hems of his model's dresses for good luck. It was his favorite flower. He viewed it as good luck. And so this is actually a vintage bottle. If you can get this bottle like I got it for 30 or 40 bucks, absolutely go for it. Even if this is not your thing, this is a reference. This is something that, you know, as a perfume lover, you'll be able to go back and reference here. Because uh, this is no, they cannot make it like this anymore. Uh, many of the materials used to create Lily of the Valley have been um, restricted out of, you know, almost making it impossible to do a proper Lily of the Valley scent. And this is Diorissimo. Diorissimo. So Diorissimo um, came out in 1956. And it's kind of this floral, fresh type fragrance. Perfect for spring. Per I would say this could easily be, be a signature scent of a classy, powerful woman. Um, I don't consider this dated or old at all. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, one of the most uh, gorgeous floral scents in my collection. But this is not the kind of thing that I want to reach for is the thing. My personal taste, I like the vintage masculines and stuff like that. And so sometimes this kind of gets relegated to the back to the back burner, if you will, but then I'll pick it up and spray it before bed one day and it's like, wow, what a fragrance this is. So again, I'm not saying that this is worse than anything else on the list. Just remember, this is just my personal preference, but Diorissimo comes in at number nine and, and it's um, Bergamot, Lily of the Valley, Lilac, um, Amirilis, Jasmine, Lily, Rosemary, Ylang Ylang, Baronia, sandalwood and civet and that civet does make it very interesting in the base but one of the best floral fragrances i would say uh in my collection diorissimo beautiful stuff um okay next on the list we have number eight and this is probably going to be a shocker to most people since uh many uh if you ask a perfumer you know, what fragrance you wish you could make that you didn't make. Many of them list this as what, what they wish they could make. Many of them list this as what they consider the greatest masculine uh, ever made. I personally disagree. Again, it's just a personal taste thing. I also think that my bottle from 2003, you know, 20 years old this bottle is, but I don't think still even it, it was what it was like whenever they released it in the 60s. So in 56, he made Diorissimo. In 1966... A decade later, he made O Sauvage, which is a legend. Um, you know, Steve McQueen is um, famous for 
saying that the reason he was able to get all the girls back in the day is because he wore Osavage. And Osavage has uh, Hedione in it. And Hedione sort of has this jasmine-y, floral-like smell to it. But it, apparently it's been proven scientifically to attract, to attract the opposite sex. Um, and it's lemon, bergamot, basil, lavender, rosemary, cumin, and fruity notes with carnation, jasmine, sandalwood, coriander, orris root, patchouli, and rose with oak moss, musk, vetiver, and amber in the base. And, you know, it really does have this citrusy, lemony, um, green, uh, lavender, very classy, very masculine. Um, it just, that sort of citrusy DNA doesn't move me. It really doesn't. I'll wear this in the summer um, because it's, you know, that's when you're supposed to wear this in the summer. And, um, and this is a vintage bottle, so I'm sure this is a lot better than the stuff that they're putting out now. But uh, still, I just, you know, this is one of those where um, there's always something in the back of my head going, you know, if I could smell a bottle from 1960, 70s, even 80s, I bet you it was much better than what they were putting out in the early 2000s. That's my guess, because Edmund Rudnitska's fragrances, all of them, even the aquatic I'm going to show you here in a minute is has a very challenging opening. And he is famous for saying that if a fragrance doesn't shock you, you know, when you first spray it, you should be shocked, almost offended. Uh, a good fragrance should almost offend you. And this doesn't have that at all. This is just sort of a pleasant citrus, lemony, uh, lavender, masculine, you know. Um, and... There is a note of cumin listed, but I get almost no cumin in this. This is like a pleasant, you know, I, this is something very pleasant and easy to wear for me. Um, and, and that's why I just see it as boring. I would much rather wear Eau Sauvage Parfum, the flanker from 2012. Uh, my buddy Rich Mitch did a comparison video between the Parfum flanker 2012 and 2017. Uh, go check that out if you're interested in learning more about the um, Parfum of Eau Sauvage. But the EDT and the Parfum are like two separate worlds as far as I'm concerned. They're like on different planets, you know. The EDT is something completely different. And, you know, I would put it in line with things like YSL Porom, which came out a couple years after Dior Eau Sauvage. Probably the, um, you know, Eau Sauvage is probably what influenced things like YSL Porom, Balenciaga Hohang. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, though, before Eau Sauvage... There was stuff like this. So in 1959, Monsieur de Givenchy uh, came out first. This may have even influenced Eau Sauvage. So uh, this sort of citrusy style, though, doesn't really move me is where I'm getting at. And that's why it's number eight on the list. But uh, if you like to smell citruses and if you like to smell fresh, the more modern version, say from 2000 onward of Eau Sauvage, could be your one of your all-time. It could be your favorite Edmund Rudnitska. It's just not mine. So number eight on the list, Eau Sauvage. Number seven, uh, we're going to stay in that sort of citrusy. I think this is a citrus chifra, technically, although it kind of has um, touches of a fougere. So it's a little bit of a blend of, of things, but I think calling it a citrus chifra, if you forced my hand, I would say it's a citrus. It's a citrusy chifra. And this is moustache at number seven. And moustache, you see there's a M-O-U-S, moustache, uh, eau de toilette cologne concentré. Now, this is the cologne concentré version. And Rochas, um, it, you know, I will say this. This fragrance, if you're a vintage lover and you want to smell Edmund Rudnitska's work from the past and you don't want to spend a lot of money, I got this bottle on eBay within the last six or seven months, I think. For $39 or something, something silly like that, shipped. So this is not, and this is long discontinued, this um, Cologne Concentrate version, long discontinued. So if this is your thing, you know, or if you're interested in kind of exploring his work and you don't want to spend a lot of money, everyone thinks that, you know, this, this hobby, you have to be rich to do it or you have to just be loaded or, you know, and that's not true at all. It all depends on you pick your places, you pick your spots, and you're not going to accumulate you know, something like this overnight. It just doesn't happen. This is, many people's collection is like a lifetime of work, 
of getting to know people, you make friends, you make connections, you uh, stuff like that in the industry, you know, in the community, if you will. But this can just be had by going to eBay at a, at a very reasonable price. And this is basil, lavender, uh, bergamot, lemon vervain, lemon, uh, petit gras, honey, geranium, jasmine, rose, carnation, oak moss, amber, musk, cedar, tonka bean, and vanilla. And the original Rojas Moustache came out in... Um, uh, the original Moustache came out in... 1949. 1949 is when the original one came out. I'm not sure when the concentrate came out, but I think it was decades later. But I don't quote me on that as I'm not 100% sure. But in the late 70s, early 80s, it was very popular for these houses to do this cologne concentrate thing. Um, YSL did it with uh, YSL Pour Homme. Um, you know, even Givenchy did it with, um, whoops, Givenchy did it with uh, Monsieur de Givenchy, which I um, much prefer the Haut Concentre. I know I've shown this on the channel a couple times lately, but I'm in love with this Haut Concentre. This is, I think, this is a much better style of this, you know, DNA than something like Eau Sauvage, personally. Um, this is fantastic. I would, I would probably take this over Moustache as well. But um, this is a very interesting fragrance because it is extremely challenging in the opening. And um, it's sort of, uh, there's a lot of civet in here and vintage civet. And it, it really, um, it, uh, it, it can shock some people and it can really put some people off. This is not going to get you compliments today. Uh, this is not going to, this is not going to be a panty dropper. Uh, it's none of that. You know, this is for people who want to study perfume history and especially get to know Edmund Rudnitska's work. And you can kind of see him forming this sort of citrusy Shepra style. Uh, it's woody, it's spicy, but you know, the uh, EDT Concentre, and the reason that I like it more is that it is just more of, of the moustache style. It does last longer, it's a little bit more intense, uh, and it feels like there's a little more heavy notes. Like for example, you'll notice that honey note here, um, and you'll notice it amped up a little bit. You'll notice a little more of the uh, oak moss and amber and stuff in the base to give it a little bit more heft. And that's why I prefer the Eau de Toilette Concentrate of these type of fragrances. Many a times I do. Many a times I prefer the Concentre, but actually YSL Pour Homme, I think I prefer the original, believe it or not. I think I prefer the original over um, the uh, Cologne Concentre or the Haut Concentre or whatever YSL called it. But this style, you know, every house kind of had its own style. This is Rochas style. So Moustache comes in at uh, number seven. Number six. Number six is the aquatic I was telling you about. One of the most uh, insane, I'm going to turn the light up just a tad here. Hope that's not too bright, but it's starting to get dark. Um, one of, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to turn on the actual light. Hang on one moment. Intermission. Entertain yourselves, boys and girls. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, let there be light. So, um, aquatics are tough. It's kind of like citrus fragrances for frag heads. You know, citrus fragrances can sometimes be tough because they're seen as kind of boring and not exciting. And aquatics can fall into that category too. Many fragrance enthusiasts like their fragrances to be heavy. They like them to be dark and rich and challenging and all, all of this stuff that you come to associate with, um, you know, um, with complex perfumery, okay? Think Serge Luton, you know, think of that dark juice Serge Luton makes, right? Stuff like that. But the aquatic category um, is a category that uh, is often also seen as sort of in that boring, you know, uh, it's not something that many frag heads want to wear. And, but this is a very interesting exception to the rule. So if you're one of those perfume nerds 
and you want to study the fragrance. You're not wearing it to be a panty dropper or to gather compliments or anything like that. This is a very, very interesting aquatic take on an aquatic. And then to top it off, it's Edmund Rudnitska's final fragrance. He put this out in 1990. And by this point, he was basically retired. Um, and I think he just saw that things like in 87, you started to see things like New, um, New West by Aramis with that aquatic note. And of course, Cool Water came out by his, by his, uh, his protege. Um, Pierre Bourdon put out Cool Water, and it was one of the biggest fragrances ever in the history of, um, in the history of fragrance. I mean, it was one of the biggest hits as far as sales go. Maybe even the best-selling men's fragrance of all time. I can't verify that, but it's up there. If it's not Cool Water, it's Cool Water has to be second, you know. And you have to remember now, Edmund Rudnitska had a big hand in Pierre Bourdon creating Cool Water. I mean, obviously he didn't have a hand as far as helped him do it, but in a way he taught him his style. He gave him that gift of, uh, of, of being able to unlock what was inside Pierre Bourdon by, by teaching him perfumery and showing him the tricks of the trade. And so when you think about that, it's a very interesting thing that Edmund Runitzko wanted to then come back out of retirement. You know, by this point, he's an old man, basically. He's retired. He passed away six years later. But um, uh, he comes out of retirement and he goes to this obscure, almost, you know, no one cares about, um, you know, this like mall brand. Uh, called Mario Valentino, and this is not the Mario, this is not Valentino. This is not the Valentino that you're thinking of. The Valentino that made, um, the Valentino that made um, Valentino Uomo Intense, for example, That's that, you know, is a Fragcom darling. This is not the same Valentino. This is a completely different company. So he goes to this smaller company, um, Mario Valentino, and they basically said, yeah, you're a legend. I mean, do whatever the hell you want. And that's exactly what he did. He created this sort of, uh, almost like an aquatic that you might say belongs in a museum. Uh, but it is one of the most interesting aquatics in my collection and I've come to love it. I have come to absolutely love it. And I think that, uh, it's just classic Edmund Runitska. If you know his work, and then if you smell uh, what he was kind of playing with from the 1950s for his wife's bespoke fragrance, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, you'll see this use of um, these aquatic materials. And the way that he uses them are so unique. So this is Ocean Rain. And this can still be had for a very reasonable price because other than the fact that this is Edmund Rudnitska's last fragrance, you know, that's the claim to fame for this fragrance, is it's Edmund Rudnitska's last fragrance. Other than that, very few people care about this. Uh, Pierre Denard did the bottle, one of the greatest bottle creators of all time. And it's a beautiful bottle. From the front, it almost looks like the sun is either rising or setting on the water, right? You can kind of see the sun almost, it makes this little back piece right here on the bottle, almost makes the sun look like it's rippling on the water. It's a brilliant bottle. Pierre, uh, Pierre Denar, Den, Denand, sorry, Pierre Denand was, um, I think the, you know, he's the, he's the uh, goat of bottle creators. Um, but this basically has this very spicy sort of, a uh, little bit of this 80s greenness to it still. There's a little bit of Artemisia in here, but this marine note that he used, so he used cyclamen, rose, thyme, and fir, amber, cedar, frankincense, leather, and moss. Remember, this is an aquatic leather, moss, amber, cedar, um, thyme, fir, rose. These are all in Artemisia, you know. So what's interesting is when you smell this, I, I describe this as having a very antiseptic-like smell. So it smells like the ocean. It smells like the ocean... Um, as the oceans were forming in my mind. This is what I think of like a very tumultuous ocean. You know, I think of, um, I think of species dying off in the, you know, uh, entire species extinct over long periods of time. Right. And those, those animals and, 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 you know, um, uh, the, 
predecessors who in, uh, used to live on the earth before we were here, the ones that lived in the ocean, they die. They would just, you know, the ocean would just swallow them up. And it's the cycle of life in the ocean. But inside of that ocean, there's death, there's decay. It's not all, you know, beautiful, smelling, salty, marine, ambergris-like notes, right? And that's what he plays with here. He plays with this theme, this sort of antiseptic, aquatic cleanliness on one hand, and this dirty ocean feel on the other. Yes, it's an aquatic, but it's one of the most insane aquatics you'll ever spell. Uh, ocean Rain by Mario Valentino. Wear this in the summer, and 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 you'll see what makes it so great. It really is. Uh, it really is not what you expect an aquatic to be, and I love it for that. Okay, next on the list, we've got number five. Number five is uh, a fragrance that I would love to check out the other. Uh, versions of this. This is the Eau de Toilette. If there's like a parfum or something, I would love to smell the parfum of this one day. But um, this is called Diorella. And Diorella um, is probably one of the greatest Chypres ever created. Um, Diorella came out in 1972 when it was very popular to put out these sort of green fragrances for women. And the 70s were famous for things like uh, Private Collection. They were famous for things like Number 19. Green, green fragrances, right? And this has a little bit of this green note. This has a little bit of that green note in, in the top. But he's mixed it with a melon freshness. Which again, we're talking 1972. Just to show how far ahead of the curve he is. His pupil, Pierre Bourdon would use this sort of melon note over and over again in fragrances in the 90s. Arolfa, Millicime Imperial, you know, stuff like that. This is 1972, though. And there's this lemony, I'm sorry, me, well, there is a little bit of a lemony, but there's this melony-like melony. -like melony. Um, there's this melon-like top note, but it's mixed with green notes of the 70s. So you get a little bit of basil um, and a beautiful honeysuckle. Mmm. Mmm. Um, I was advised no longer to curse whenever I um, sniff the bottle. I'm apt to go, mmm, whenever I smell something that I just absolutely love. Uh, it's a reaction. So instead, I'm going to laugh. <laughs> I'm going to laugh. Or I'm just going to say, mmm, or my God. But I'm going to try not to curse anymore uh, because we do want to keep this a family show. So um, we have jasmine, rose, carnation, cyclamen, and peach. And that peach note is spot on beautiful. Uh, oak moss, vetiver, musk, and patchouli. What a, what a sheepra. It's floral. It's fruity. But it also has that sort of melony freshness. Uh, melony sounds like the girl's name, Melanie. Instead, it's melon E. this sort of melon-like freshness. Um, and it's it's stunning. I mean, it's amazing. It's... it's uh, just goes to show how many outstanding fragrances he has that that is number five. Okay, number four is the one that I'm going to cheat on. Number four is the one that the uh, hard liners may take offense with because uh, number four is a fragrance that he technically did not create the original of. That was Jean, Car Jean Carl's. Um... But he's credited on Parfumo for having the, um, the like, I think it was like maybe the 70s, 80s, 90s reformulation. So I'm going to include this in the video. Even though it's a little bit of a cheat, I'm going to include it. So this is number four, and this is Miss Dior Esprit de Parfum. Esprit de Parfum. The discontinued Esprit de Parfum. And this is a vintage bottle, uh, a vintage refill. And I just basically told Anuj, Anuj at Enchante Perfumes, I still get people all the time who are like, who is this Anuj guy you're talking about? Anuj, Enchante Perfumes. If you're into vintage fragrances, go to EnchantePerfumes.com and it's the best little perfume shop in the world as far as I'm concerned. Not sponsored, not sponsored, just my opinion over knowing the man and getting to know who he is. Um... As, as a trustworthy person that I can that I can give to you and stand behind and know you will be taken care of, absolutely, 100%. Um, and so that's where I got this from. I said, give me the oldest one you, you have. And the reason I did that is because 
This has gone through many reformulations. And so if you look, you'll see, uh, I believe that's the older address for Dior. It's also Christian Dior. The new ones are just Dior. Um, and, and the juice. Oh, the, uh, it was so good, I almost cursed right there again. The, ju the juice. Oh my God. Um, one of the greatest fragrances for, for women ever created. Um, I think the original came out sometime in the 40s. Don't quote me on it. But um, this version, I think, came out sometime in the 80s. The Esprit de Parfum. Um, but it's Galbanum. One of my favorite Galbanum fragrances of all time. It's Galbanum, Sage, Bergamot, and Gardenia. And uh, there's a couple notes here which make it feminine. But there's a couple notes here that make it very masculine. So the notes that make it feminine are gardenia and jasmine and narcissus. Those are the three notes that I would really say push it more to the feminine side. But that galbanum and sage combination at the top has... Imagine if you like extrapolated the green notes out of Bandi, and I know Bandi is extremely harsh and challenging leather, but imagine it had no leather in it, and you just took that galbanum and sage, and maybe a little bit of this smoky tobacco-like feel. There's no tobacco listed, but I think the labdanum and patchouli kind of blend to give off this tobacco-like feel to me, almost like there's this, there's a slight stale cigarette note, right? Um, but old school carnation, rose, freshness of neroli, oak moss, patchouli, labdanum, and sandalwood. Other than the gardenia, jasmine, and narcissus, this is a masculine fragrance. This is extremely masculine, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I have, I have no problem wearing this. I love this stuff. Um, the, the only thing I will say is I think the jasmine, uh, or jasmine, narcissus, gardenia combo, whatever you want to call it, makes it go slightly powdery. There is a point in the mid where you will pick up this powdery light aspect, which many men would probably associate more with traditionally feminine fragrances, right? Um, but if you are having, if you have an open mind and you're a guy, uh, this is one of the must sniff women's fragrances. It is so good. Um, so, so good. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's good stuff. Okay. Next on the list. Uh, number three, top three. Uh, number three is, this is a great find for me. And I have to give a special shout out to Armando because I was sitting here one day minding my own business and I get a text pop up from Armando and it's, dude, there's a uh, pre-Estee Lauder bottle of uh, Frederick Malls Le Parfum de Therese on eBay. You'll never see it again. Go get it. And uh, for his kindness, I sent him a 10 ml decant. So I hope you have enjoyed that decant, Armando. He sent me so many things I can't even. But um, uh, I did try to give him back a little bit. Um, this is this. Michelle Rudnitska, interestingly enough, I watched an interview with him. If you actually type in, you know, uh, Frederick Mall, Le Parfum de Therese, and you go to uh, Frederick Mall's uh, YouTube channel, there's an interview with Michelle Rudnitska, his son, and he says that this is his father's masterpiece, in his opinion. Now, he's a perfumer. He grew up around these materials. He's running the oil house, I think, that his father founded. Or he has his own oil house business now or something like that. But um, for him to say this is the greatest creation of his father says a lot. And this is, for the warm weather, I mean, this is stunning. This is basically a leather sheepra. This is a leather sheepra. I love leather sheepras. You guys know that. Leather Sheepras are one of my favorite categories of all time. I've mentioned things like Azure before, which is marketed towards women. This is technically marketed towards women, but it is completely and utterly unisex wearable for a man. No problem at all. Again, it has this melon-like note in the top that you'll be reminded of here and here. Okay? Um, it has this melon-like note with... Jasmine, mandarin orange, and pepper. And it opens up peppery, but instantly you're going to get one of the most amazing plums. And the plum 
will remind you of a note of plum that he was playing with in Rochas Femme, uh, which is coming up very, very soon. And so if you know kind of the plum from Rochas Femme, and you know the melon notes from Dior Diorella, which came uh, decades later after this, even though this was released in the year 2000, it was created in the 1950s. And this was actually a fragrance that was, um, this is a fragrance that was created for his wife as a bespoke fragrance. So she wore this as her scent for, for life, basically, until he passed away. And there's two stories that go with uh, Frederick Maul. One is Frederick Maul literally begged the estate of, of Edmund Rudnitska to use this because he thought it was such a brilliant uh, piece of work. Uh, and the second story is that she went to him because she wanted her husband's work to live on. She realized how beautiful of a fragrance it was, and she wanted her husband's work to live on with the rest of us to, to share what he created. Uh, either way, however it happened, thank God it happened. Um, the leather with the woods, with the, fr you know, fruity, violety, um, spicy thing. Oh, Jesus. Hmm. So, Le Parfum de Therese, um, and, and if you can find these pre-Este Louder bottles, I would say go for it. Uh, okay, number two. I already let the cat out of the bag. This is uh, Rochas Femme uh, in any form that you get. This is the uh, vintage Parfum de Toilette right here. But honestly, get anything, anything you can find. Um, even the new one is good. Even the one you can just go buy for 20 bucks right now is good. The Olivier Crest reformulation. But I think this is an 80s bottle, is my guess. Maybe in early 90s, I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but Rochas Femme almost went number one. Literally, all, I almost put this number one. And the reason I almost put it number one is I think that this is one of the most amazing pieces of work I've ever smelled. Um... It's, a, it's basically a floral chipra, but it's more than that. It's a floral chipra mixed with an oriental. So if you are a fan of things like, I'll give you a couple examples of fragrances that it, um, fragrances that it inspired later on. So one is, I just recently unboxed this, if you watched my, the last vintage haul. This is Van Cleef and Arpel's Gem. This is a gem, by the way. If you love Rochas Femme, I'm going to highly encourage you. This is required sniffing. Um, required sniffing for a, uh, for, for a lover of that sort of Chipra um, oriental style. And I haven't done a comparison video, so I don't know exactly what the comparison is. Uh, but I don't, you know, no, when you have one on one hand, one on the other, you can really sometimes dig into the details. But from memory... This is heavily, heavily inspired. This came out in the late 80s by Van Cleef and Arpels. Um, this is heavily, heavily inspired by Rochas Femme. Heavily. Uh, if you know things like this, this is MDCI's Shipra Palaton. And Shipra Palaton is a... Um, <laughs> it's a Bertrand du Chafour. Fudge, man. Oh, um, so Sheep or Palatum, probably full bottle worthy for me one day. Um, but Rochas Femme is this amazing, I mean, almost magical blend to me of woods, rosewood, amazing rosewood with this succulent peach apricot plum. So a trio of fruits, but mostly it's that plum. It's almost like this syrupy plum with, um, I mean, just cinnamon, iris, it's posh, it's high class, all of the ingredients smell of the absolute highest quality. There's a little bit of immortel in here, which gives it this slightly, um, you know, underneath all of the resins and benzoin and ambers and stuff like that, the immortel just gives it a slight crispness, you know, almost like the the... Almost like the flowers you're smelling, the jasmine and the and the May Rose and the Ylang Ylang, 
just have been seared a little bit by the sun. Maybe they just didn't get enough water and they're just a little bit crispy. That's what the Immortel does to it. But the Iris, <laughs> I mean, the Iris makes this sort of ambery, benzoiny quality um, just pop. It's like a secret ingredient. I always find iris to be like a secret ingredient. You know, it just adds this third dimension. It adds another dimension to the fragrance when you smell it. And then, of course, you get my favorite notes. You get leather in the base. And so imagine all of this and the color of the juice. And don't let the fact that it's Rochas Femme put you off. Um, this is completely 1,000% um unisex very wearable by a man um so good it was almost number one but um it it fell to number two because my favorite and if you know me you know what's coming it's not a surprise oh by the way i do have the um thanks to anuj i was able to score the pure parfum of um Rochas femme as well and i can tell you that it is uh it is stunning you know, it's a it's a stunning fragrance. I'll do I'll do a review one day of both. Huh. Believe it or not, I prefer the Parfum de Toilette, and I feel the same way about Mitsuko. I uh, believe so far my testings of Mitsuko, the Parfum de Toilette, the Parfum de Toilette formulas from the '80s. There's something special about them to me. Um, but but yes, Rochas Femme in any form is amazing. So, number one, no surprise. If you know, you know. And this is all the way back to 1951. And this is so influential of a fragrance. Like I said, if you've smelled any of Jean-Claude Elena's work, if you've smelled Queer d'Ange, you'll smell a little bit of Eau de Hermes. If you've smelled Cartier's Declaration, which was a huge hit uh, for Cartier. And it actually made, I think, Hermes lock up Jean-Claude Elena long term because they said, wait a minute, Jean-Claude Elena just created uh, an Hermes fragrance in a Cartier bottle. What are we doing? You know, he should be working for us. And that's where he kind of took that DNA and ran with it and, and let Hermes have that sort of watercolor uh, transparent DNA. And what's interesting is there's a little bit of that in Eau de Hermes, but no one will call Eau de Hermes transparent or watercolor by any stretch, but you can almost see the beginnings of that idea. And what's so interesting about um, what's so interesting about Eau de Hermes to me is that this was a fragrance created that was never intended to be sold. They never thought that anyone would actually buy this. Look how they used to do it back in the day: hand engraving on each bottle. Mm. Oh. Oh, just a video of me moaning while sniffing fragrances. Unbelievable. Um, and this little piece of leather right here smells fantastic. So, um, this was expected to be given, actually, as a gift. They expected this to be given to people who um, purchased a Hermes you know, saddle or bag or whatever they bought back then that they deemed worthy, they would throw the free fragrance in. And initially, it wasn't actually supposed to be just for anything. It was supposed to be, I believe, for their um, for their Birkin bag. So whenever you bought a Birkin bag, uh, you could take Eau de Hermes and spray the inside of your bag. And it was supposed to give it that fresh new bag smell, basically. And what does the inside of a new of a bag smell like? Well, it smells like leather. And uh, maybe a little bit of vanilla because maybe there was some cosmetics in there from, from, you know, the woman's bag that carried it around and spices. And so what he ended up creating is he ended up creating a fragrance that has one of my favorite openings of all time, all time. It's got this um, sort of red hot cinnamon animalic civet birch tar leather opening. Uh, well, and dry down too, but... The opening hits you with sort of spices right off the bat, cardamom, cinnamon, clover, but you're hit with a very beautiful lavender um, and animalic notes. Sort of imagine cinnamon red hots with spices and animalic notes. Civet, civet hits you right away. 
uh, and it is beautiful, gorgeous. And then it dries down to more traditional vanilla, geranium, tonka, jasmine, but it's that birchy, leather, woody dry down that I really feel like could be a signature scent for me. This could be a year round fragrance for me. Uh, this could be a year round fragrance. And this particular style of bottle right here, a flacon, corresponds to a corresponds to a uh, time in Oda Hermes's life when it was called the pewter cap. So they went pewter cap, copper cap, and then uh, I think see-through cap, and then black cap. So there's been like four iterations. Apparently they're all good, but the version that I have with this particular, um, you know, sticker on the front, excuse me, corresponds to the pewter cap from my uh, research. I don't, I, I, worse at, at, at the, if it's the, um, next one, it would be the copper cap. So it's either copper or pewter, but I'm thinking that this is the pewter cap. Uh, but this fragrance I think is his masterpiece to me. And I just, you look at the stuff that it has influenced and, you know, you look at the house that it ended up creating, you know, Hermes was a leather house before this. They had no they weren't even thinking about perfume. This was created almost as an accident. Uh, and it's so perfect. I, I just got a whiff of that. Oh, that spicy. I, it so captures the Hermes DNA um, that I completely see. I can see now that I've spent more and more time with it. Why Jean-Claude Elena being the pupil of Edmund Rudnitska, who kind of had like a long distance you know, teacher relationship. He didn't get the hands-on love that uh, Pierre Bourdon got, right? And so I can completely see why he would create this. 100% I could see why. Uh, and it's it's interesting when you smell this and you compare it to Eau de Hermes because it really is, it's truly a love letter. It's a, you know, it's almost like a take a knee to the great Eau de Hermes and bring that DNA back um, and, you know, try to modernize it a little bit. But it's just so interesting to me how influential Eau de Hermes was, is, and still is. Uh, and I'm just, I'm, I'm very blessed to have what I have. You know, this actually cracked. I, I dropped it and, it and it cracked right here. So I panicked and I put it in another container because I didn't want to lose uh, a drop of juice, but it probably would have been fine in here, but uh, I, I sort of panicked. But either way, all I have is maybe six, 50 mils. I only have like 50 mils of this and that's it. And it's one of my favorite fragrances of all time. But uh, but yes, I am, um, uh, I am extremely happy that between the last Edmund Rudnitska video that I did and now the ranked video that I've added a couple of his work. So we got to nine, not a top 10, but a top nine. That's good enough for me. I, uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I wanted to keep it around an hour or, or so. So uh, thank you everyone for watching. Do like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help the algorithm. It does help the channel. We are growing fast. I'm starting to get more and more people writing and it's getting harder and harder to keep up with the comments. I try to respond personally to every single comment that I can. Um, but I, I love the camaraderie. I love the friendship. I love the community. Uh, the fragrance community is filled with unbelievable people, um, amazing generosity, and they want to share their passion with you. You know, some communities have big barriers to entry. You could go spend 30, 40 bucks on this. This is only a 50 mil bottle. Go spend 30 bucks or 40 bucks on Cartier's declaration and just, you know, and, and just, um, enjoy, you know, start getting into it. Start, um, start being part of the community and watch videos and, and there's so much to learn. You know, and that's what's so great. And people are open to share. They want to share. They want to send decants and, and share the collection with people and, and have, you know, have the fragrance community grow. Because the more the fragrance community go grows, the better chance we have of these houses putting out more quality work. Because right now, they're just appealing to the lowest common denominator. And it's our fault. It's, it's our fault as consumers for not holding them to a higher standard. We should be holding them 
to a higher standard as consumers. We should say, no, we're not going to buy another clone of a blue fragrance, you know, that's done a million times for $380. No, we're not going to, we're not going to buy, we're going to vote with our dollars. But it's interesting, more and more people are interested in the vintages, they're interested in what was done in the past, because that's the decades where perfume was interesting, when Edmund Rudnitska was creating. Uh, and so that's why I think these videos are so important. But um, do leave a comment, let me know what your favorite Edmund Rudnitska fragrance is. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Cheers, guys, and I'll hopefully catch you next time. Bye-bye.